welcome all to my conversation with Tom Hodgkins, which has been a, a great influence actually on my life and my wife's life as well. Uh, I think about more 15 years ago, I remember I read a piece about Tom in the German news magazine, Die Zeit of the Time. And it was about his first book, How to Be Idle, Muse und Müsigang in German. And I thought, yes, that's what I'd like to do to be than a worker rather than living in the total uh, the world of total work and uh, it's actually taken me personally to to freiburg at some point university of freiburg where i was a research fellow in the musa and the idleness and leisure research group and i should also mention that six years ago tom gave me one of the first he gave me one of the first stages actually to give a talk on Nietzsche on life affirmation. I remember meeting you for lunch, we had teas and wine together, and then a couple of weeks later I gave a talk on Amor Fati, so thanks very much for that again. So I'd like to talk to you wherever the conversation takes us really, as idlers do, but perhaps we begin just how you got into all of this and what your life philosophy is and has become. I suppose I got into it when I was a student at uh, Cambridge doing English in the late 80s. Um, I was actually just reading Keats, Keats's letters where he, uh, well, there's a poem by Keats where he talks about how lazy he was. No, sorry, it was Wordsworth. Um, the Romantic poets are all fantastic, um, but there's, there's a little bit of a Wordsworth poem that the reader sent me where he talks about this sort of um, uh, dignified lounging that they did at, at university and they could sit around doing nothing all afternoon. Um, and I really enjoyed doing nothing at university uh, without any guilt. And we used to sit in the cafes all afternoon, but I was also very creative. Um, and towards the end of the course, I worked quite hard and did okay. Um, I really enjoyed the mixture of activities. I played in a band, I was a DJ, I ran a magazine. <clears throat> I didn't do any of these things to make money, I just did them for fun. Yeah. You had a basic income as a student, you had your room. Um, it's a very nice life. Yeah. And uh, then I came to London and I, my, I got a job at a record shop called Rough Trade. And that was also a great year. Um, I met a different kind of person. They weren't Oxbridge type people, but they're very talented, creative entrepreneurs and artists who are into skateboarding and music and so on. Yeah. That was very inspiring. And then that was followed by a couple of years of working at a magazine, The Sunday Mirror. And I really hated that. That was a horrible job for about two years. I just hated being there and I, I didn't like the other people. Um, I didn't like the feeling of slavery of working in a full-time job. Yeah. And it was while I was at that magazine that I decided I wanted to start my own magazine called The Idler. And the name of The Idler came from Dr. Johnson, who wrote the first English dictionary. Yes. And he was a lovely 18th century character, as you may know. Um, you know, he was very convivial. He was, he, he was, he was prone to melancholy. Uh, he drank a lot. He was wonderful company. He yeah. got very depressed. Uh, he was lazy. He was productive. <laughs> he was brilliant. Um, he, he worked at great speed uh, and lay in bed until two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you know, and he's such an attractive character in so many ways. And he wrote a, a series of essays called The Idler. Yeah. And he, he, he thought he was an idler. But he didn't mean that he did nothing. He just meant that he had, it was a, it was a sort of state of mind um, where, you know, he, he was naturally, uh, he said, constitutionally lazy. And that's how I felt. I, found it, yeah. I still find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning. I just like lying there doing nothing. But there's something else that makes you want to, be, to, to, to work and to be creative. And so the magazine, I formed it really to explore this idea that, you know, idleness is something that's good. People yeah. feel guilty about it. And um, but it's a very important part of life. And then over the last 25 years, I've, I've researched it thoroughly. I've written books about it. I've run a magazine called The Idler. I more recently uh, started a sort of school um, called The Idler Academy. We started life at festivals. It's now mainly online, and we teach people philosophy and uh, singing, ukulele, whatever it might be. All the things that improve your life, I think. Um, and uh, we have three three corners of the curriculum, and they are philosophy, 
husbandry and merriment and so we know what philosophy means the, the love of wisdom or the yeah. you know the moving towards wisdom yeah um husbandry is about uh cooking cleaning looking after pigs growing vegetables making things that sort of thing and then merriment that's another important part of life having fun dancing and singing drinking uh and being with other people well right now we can't be with other people but we can still sing and dance perhaps yes and what's your why did you choose the word idleness rather than leisure well i guess thought idler is a you know idler is a is a lovely english word um there's something a bit positive about it you know it was like something a little bit different from just being lazy so uh, idler i think it feels a little bit more noble like um you might be talking about meditation or you know the, the way a monk might be idle um yeah. but the monk is studying and working and praying and going for long walks and thinking and um and leisure I, I think in leisure english is a boring word because it it sounds it reminds you of leisure center um like a, a council swimming pool or like organized fun that's organized by by the authorities for you yeah. um and leisure means comes from licere in latin meaning to be permitted yes so it, sound, it sounds a little bit like you've been you know uh, yes. the authorities have allowed you this leisure time yes but i do like the word scole we've talked about this before johannes yes we have and i know you've written about it the word scole the greek word for school yeah. uh, which actually meant like you know can be translated as leisure that's a lovely word because that's kind of it means cultivated leisure yeah um so uh you know because leisure could just mean sort of you know mindless activity just to escape from work um yeah, yeah. but scole is something a bit more engaged so scole was really what the philosophers did it was your leisure time it was your free time um and uh, you know free time is really really important to the ancient athenians yes. because that's where you could really live and so work was a means to an end work um earned you money to buy the free time during which you became who you were or you became a philosopher or you attempted to develop a good life so i think scole is a nice word but you can't you know it's too academic to to use it in everyday language so um so i think idler is is quite a nice term the yes. problem is that people say oh well you're not an idler at all because you're really busy um and being being idle seems to involve an awful lot of work you have to sing dance play the ukulele uh, <coughs> read nietzsche and the letters of keats um, yeah. or whatever yeah um and people say oh, we should you should it shouldn't be called the idler it should be called you know the sort of the creative or something like that but i just think idler is a lovely word and it was good enough for dr johnson there was there've been other idler magazines there was an idler magazine um in uh, around the turn of the century by jerome k jerome who wrote three men in a boat and three men on the bubble about a, a bicycle ride in germany um he was a brilliant writer, he was a top bestseller, and he, he, his magazine was called The Idler. I have some copies at home. And that's a, a really fun, light magazine. There were loads of these magazines in Victorian times. There was no radio, there was no telly, there was no internet, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, Dickens published in serial form. So magazines were massive. And this Idler magazine was quite popular. And there have been other Idler. There was a, an Idler magazine in India. There was, there was one in Canada. I think it's a lovely name for a magazine. And it's it's an it's an eighteenth century name. It was born in the eighteenth century with Dr. Johnson's Idler column or magazine, um, and that was that was the same time as you know he wrote essays called the Rambler. Yeah. Uh, there was the Spectator magazine, there was the Tatler magazine, there was the Observer and the Adventurer, and so there's this lovely idea that you um, in French it's flaneur in the nineteenth century. You you sort of wander around the city. Yeah. Make no take observations um yeah. so the idler has something of that but also from the beginning i wanted it to have what i call californian subjects so um yeah you know the weird stuff drugs magic mushrooms in issue one in 1993 we ran an interview with terence mckenna mm -hmm. um who's dead now but he was a real a pioneer of uh magic mushroom research dmt research and so on so there's that whole side to the idler which is the more esoteric stuff um i think is interesting and I wanted to bring those two things together. So you have the 18th century idea of the, the gentleman wandering around 
making witty comments about things. Yeah. Um, and then combine that with a sort of, um, yeah. uh, you know, that, that sort of weird stuff. And then now with the magazine, we, ha we have lots of practical articles about, you know, how to live a good life. How do you keep bees? Um, what sort of a garden do you want to grow? And I think these are important things too. So yeah. you could say the whole thing is about some idea of cultivation. So we need to find the time to cultivate ourselves cultivate our souls and cultivate our own gardens and our own homes as well. That's important too. Yeah. So the Idler magazine hopefully brings all that stuff together. And I think it's a nice name, Idler. Yeah, it, it's, to me, it has the air of being, not a native speaker, it has the, a bit of an air of a free spirit to it too. Someone yeah. who's uh, spending yeah. some pressures, right? Yeah, and I think idling, idling and being lazy is very often um, an expression of an independent spirit. So, uh, you know, if you're stuck in a job that you don't like, then you will tend to, you know, be lazy in the job, skive off, uh, <clears throat> arrive late, um, have a longer lunch break and this sort of thing. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're lazy, it just means you're doing the wrong thing. So, uh, you know, like a musician, if you, if you find what you want to do, you can practice all, all day long um, and it's not really work. So, but yes, I think that the, the idleness is, is an expression of, this, of, of a, a spirit of freedom and freedom seeking. Um, yeah. And in fact, I think they're almost the same word, you know, idling and freedom. But the idea is not that you sort of don't do anything, but you, 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 you resist slavery you know that's what freedom is about it's about resisting slavery and for many people a full-time job can feel very much like slavery i'm not comparing it to real slavery yes um, yeah. because you can leave <laughs> you can get paid um and uh, and and some jobs are very pleasant you know um but at the same time it's really very very common for people to hate their job not only that but they, that their job can contribute to their uh, uh, really, really serious mental health problems. Yes. I think something like a third of the people in the UK really hate their job. Um, so those are the people I'm talking to. Like, you don't have to stick, you don't have to stay in that job. Um, I know what it feels like, you know, when I had a bad job, I felt, um, I felt like a slave. And uh, that's a horrible feeling. So we're trying to help people to find freedom through idling. Yes, and when you say you know resist slavery, of course that is rem reminiscent of Nietzsche's slave morality. Oh, this is something yeah, that's right. yeah. that we, we, you rather choose to be uh, of the master morality and taking risk in your own hand and things in your own hand, rather than yeah. I think that's right. And I think people misunderstand Nietzsche because I think what I would take from that is 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 that anybody can have a master morality. Um, he didn't like Christianity because he felt that. It encouraged a kind of abject submission to authority, um, but there's there's other you know Christianity doesn't have to mean that. Um, in fact, originally Christ, Christianity was all about some kind of uh, freedom, but combined with compassion. So the problem with Nietzsche, or at least the problem that people have with Nietzsche, or their understanding of Nietzsche, is that his philosophy feels like it lacks in compassion. Um, get out of my way, I'm, 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 I'm a ubermensch or whatever. Um, but actually, I think it's about, um, it's about taking responsibility for yourself. Um, and it's basically about not moaning, you know, um, <laughs> oh no, poor me, everything's, you know, everything's my, uh, you know, he's really against self-pity, isn't he? Yes. Um, and I think that, and that's, and also he, he's, you know, I quoted one of my books, a really lovely passage, I can't remember which book it comes from, but it's about um, uh, it's about how, how people work too hard. You yeah. know, and he saw hard work as part of that slavish morality too. Um, hard work for money or hard work for your boss or status or whatever. He yeah. thought that was a kind of mark of uh, someone a bit slavish. And he said, like, you know, in the old days, the, the noble people were embarrassed to admit that they worked. And he said, Otium and Bellum, yes. that's what the ancients were uh, interested in. Yes. Pleasure and war. <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'll take out the bell and bet, but um, yeah. you know, and so, so he, my idea is that everybody can access the life of a of an of otium, yeah. or you know, 
Gole. Um, we get criticised because it's like, well, it's all right for you with your Cambridge education and, you know, um, we can't all, you know, we can't all be idlers. Um, but I think we can all be idlers, at least a little bit. Um, you can be an idler while having a full-time job because you can think, well, okay, this job is not me personally. I, you know, yeah, it's not stressful. Um, I mean, the, the more menial jobs like, um, I don't know, like a scaffold, being a scaffolder or something like that, you know, the, 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 uh, the dustmen, they don't think they're going to find meaning from their job. It's just, you know, it's a way to earn some money. And they have a life outside of that, you know. Um, that's that's a, a completely sort of reasonable way of, of working um, and living. In, in my case, I, I've kind of, in a way, prostituted my talents because I, I've sort of taken my, the things I like doing um, and made those into some sort of a living. And then, yeah, that, yeah. that's another way of doing it. Um, and, you know, I've got friends who, uh, a friend who is an accountant, um, okay, he doesn't talk about his job. It, it's not like he finds fulfillment particularly, but he he doesn't mind it. And he goes into, and my accountant's the same, that they, they go into work, they do, they do their accounting, they help people, they earn some money, and they have this life outside of that. Um, so um, there are those people who are fine in their jobs and they can be an idler outside. Then there's the people who really, really hate their jobs. Well, that, that's bad, you know. Um, yeah. And then, then there are the creative people, the small business people, the freelancers. Yes. Um, you know, the sort of semi-academics and that category of person. And th there's a lot of those people. Um, that's probably our main, my main audience. It's people who are like, hang on, you know, I don't like this system. I want to I create my own life. And I think that's, that's what I take from Nietzsche, to go yeah. back to the original question, is that... Um, Nietzsche was saying, you know, like live, live well, you know, um, live, live intensely. Um, don't give up. Uh, don't complain. Don't moan. You can change your own life sort of thing. Um, so, so, you know, take, take the, take the reins of your life. And if you don't like it, then it's up to you to change it. Uh, and that's a very inspiring philosophy. The only problem with that, as I said, is it, it can, um, well, I think there's two problems. One, um, it can uh, it can lead to sort of selfishness of, of a sort of Boris Johnson sort of type, um, where it's just me first, uh, and also um, and, and a sort of lack of compassion, you know. Um, so uh, you know, there's something good about very good about Christianity because it, it, it encourages you to look after other people, yeah, um, and to look after the weak and the sick. And also, you know, I think sometimes. It's not your fault. Yeah. You know, there's this kind of modern self-help thing where it's like, you know, you, you know, um, you need to take responsibility for your own shit. Well, you know, we're, we're all, some people are very lucky and some people are very unlucky. Um, yeah. Sorry, that's just the end of it. Yeah, you can change your mental attitudes. But what about if you've, um, I mean, my, my son just spent a year in Naples. He's 20 and he made friends with, um, uh, migrants from places like the Gambia. Well, <laughs> you can't just say sort your life out, you know, pull your socks off. I mean, these guys have seen half their friends yeah. drowned in the sea. They've been enslaved in Libya. They've walked across the desert. They've been put in dungeons for six months. They've been then enslaved by the mafia. They can't move. You know, they've got no money. And it's really not <laughs> their fault. Um, so, you know, there is injustice is what I'm saying. Um, so, you know, the legal system and the justice system is a very good thing to try to level the playing field. But still, you know, um, and now we're in the middle of COVID. How do you, how do you react? Well, you can yeah. control your own reactions. Um, and people can get, people get very angry in different ways. Um, you know, for, for my mother and my father, they don't understand why the whole world has closed down for... Uh, a disease that has killed relatively few people. I mean, I know it's killed a lot of people, but they don't think that more people particularly have died in March than normally die in March. Um, I think that's an interesting point of view. And then other people are very angry because governments don't introduce enough restrictions on their movements. Um, and we all feel more or less powerless. Yeah. Um, so you do have to sort of turn in on your mind and kind of accept things as they are. Uh, to an extent, um, and uh, and change your own attitude first. So anyway, this is all. These are all. 
yeah what we do at the idler it's all about this this talking this sort of nonsense all day which i enjoy <laughs> and reading <laughs> reading keats um, and reading yeah you've been reading keats this morning right what were you well, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of you know um we've been actually quite horribly busy the last two weeks with the idler um like you know it's a business it's a magazine we have subscribers we sell copies in newsstands we have two part-time assistants and our whole world has been turned upside down like so many other people um we're quite lucky that we we have subscribers so they're not going to go away hopefully um and we have a uh a, an online element to what we do in our online courses um but at the same time probably all our events are going to be cancelled um and so I, I've been quite stressed out <laughs> and quite busy. So, but I, I'm finding it really helps to, to, uh, you know, I've got to schedule in the idleness a bit. So, so this yeah. morning I scheduled in 10 minutes of meditation. Um, I guess 10 minutes of reading um, some uh, Keats's letters, the yeah. letters of, Tom, of Keats to his brother and his other friends. And they're so lovely. And he, he has lots of interest. He has lots of relevant thoughts about, you know how to find that space of peace within your own mind um he died when he was 25 yeah he must have known he was dying but the letters are so full of life and they're so positive and his words the way he uses language is amazing i mean it makes when you read it you feel like a very boring pedestrian writer he has such a light touch um very playful uh lots of parodies lots of jokes lots of puns um Probably we don't get half the jokes today because it was written in 1820 or something. Yeah. Um, so that's been really, really nice. And, um, and Keats himself says, you know, uh, you could pass a very nice day just by reading uh, a few lines of poetry, like six lines of poetry um, yeah. in the morning and just letting that stuff, you know, rebound around your head. And so at lunchtime, when I, I had my sandwich in my office, um, where I am on my own, yeah. um, I read a bit of his Lester's um, and then he, he has these poems within the letters, and I don't understand the, po the po poems completely on first effort. And then I found myself writing a poem today. I don't know why, I just started writing a poem about um, my friend Sam Lee, who has a thing about the nightingale. Um, and I, I wrote a, a, like a really crappy little poem, which I just emailed to him. What did he say? Did he get back to you already? No. He hasn't got back to me yet, no. <laughs> <You're okay. laughs> He's not answering his emails. He's quite idle, I think. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but this is a time where people have to learn to be idle. One of the sad phenomena of our age is that people spend their leisure where they're licensed to have free time binge watching Netflix, for example. Yeah. Which I sometimes refer to as a death machine. It kills you from the inside out slowly and painfully. It really does, yeah. We're, it sucks out your life. I, and you, pay for it. You, you pay that thing to kill you slowly and painfully. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get rid of it. It's so violent. Um, we're watching, I mean, they're very good. We're watching something called Sneaky Pete. Um, and it's, it's just so horrible. I mean, it's all the negative, it's, it's a bit like Breaking Bad. It's all the like negative emotions greed, lust, anger. You know, it's, it's like all the seven deadly sins rolled into one. Um, <laughs> But then, you know, I sort of think, well, you know, I used to enjoy, I, I could, I, you know, maybe like Dr. Faustus and Shakespeare, they were, they were the kind of Netflix of their day in a way. Um, the Greek tragedy, you know, the, the Greeks went to see these awful uh, tra tragic plays, um, like 50,000 people going to the theatre. So I think there is something in people that, like, and there's Tarantino, you know, it's, 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 um, What's the word, Johannes, when you experience something through somebody else? Um, we care vicariously? It's, uh, not, no. Yeah, vicariously, but it, it's, the, it's the sort of uh, what drama does to you. Um, it sort of gets rid of these emotions in a harmless way. Catharsis? Um, sorry? Catharsis? Cathar yeah, catharsis, yeah. exactly. So yeah. There, there, yeah. It, I think there is some catharsis in it. Um, uh, you, you know, but you've got to read Keats as well, I think. Um, but yes, right now people need to be taught how to be idle because it's it's actually quite a difficult thing to do. You know, where should I mean, one start? Yeah, where should, like one, where should one start, or how should one start? Well, I think you start by by thinking, okay, is, 
firstly, you've got to tell yourself it, it's a really good idea to be idle. Um, yeah. It's good for your mental health and it's good for your physical health. Um, and you need to sleep more and spend more time doing nothing because people feel guilty. Yeah. So over, over the years, what people say to me again and again, oh, well, you know, I'd like to be idle, but I feel so guilty when I'm doing nothing. And I say, well, that's, you know, the guilt is man-made. In fact, I get that from Nietzsche because Nietzsche says guilt is from the word gilda, a feeling of de indebtedness. Yeah. Um, and lots of people don't feel it. Lots of cultures around the world today and lots of cultures in the past did not feel guilty about idling. You know, so that to me just simply proves that it's something that's conditioned by society. So I think that step number one is remove that guilt. <laughs> you know, that you need to be idle. It's good for you to be idle. Like, Work, work harder at being idle. Um, make that idling time because, you know, it, it's, it, it's a responsibility to yourself and it's a responsibility to other people. Um, if I don't get enough idling time, then I become grumpy and aggressive and angry and so on. Um, that's not good for the people I work with and my family. So th there's a, okay, but we're so busy, it's hard to be idle. Yeah. At least now with coronavirus, we do at least have some more time. I mean, it's incredibly difficult because, you know, our, our mental states are woo, all over the place. I mean, what, you know, you're happy and sad. Like one day I'm like, this is great. I've got loads of time. We can bicycle around the city. And then the next time I'm like, I want to kill myself. I like life how it was before. It was so good before. Can't we go back to that? Um, my mother is so depressed, you know, I can't go and visit her and, uh, my in-laws are miserable and we can't go and see them. Um, my children are like Hitler youth of like communist China and sort of <coughs> watching me just slipping up. Well, you haven't washed your hands, you know. Um, I, like, I want to go and see Granny Liz. You can't go and see Granny Liz. Haven't you heard about coronavirus? Um, so they think I'm not doing enough to protect myself. Um, so it's a horrible situation. You can't, you know, you can't go and see your friends. Yeah. Uh, so that's very, it's very difficult. I know that. Um, but at the same time, yeah, there is this time at least, um, for, you know, I'm, I'm reading Dickens as well. Uh, mm. yeah. walk around a little bit more. Yes. And... Night walks. <laughs> Wonderful text. It's just, yeah. You know, so yeah, there, there's, yeah. There, there, there is, there is an opportunity. Yeah. Idol. And then also, you know, lots of people are saying there's an opportunity to, um, uh, discover the anarchist principles of life, which I try to adhere to, which is about community, um, compassion and helping each other. So this, there is this neighborliness. Yeah. Neighborliness is coming back. And, you know, we used to complain about being separated. Well, it's strange paradox, but um, we're more separated than ever. But at the same time, there's a return of community um, and yes. people helping each other. Yes, I think to. anyway, you know, I mean, people talk about that, people sort of boast about it. If, uh, if it, I don't know if it's real, but it feels like that. Yeah. So that's a good thing. And, um, you know, um, I, I think if I, if, if a company like, if the big evil companies collapse, then that's good. Uh, so there are, there are good things about this possibly. Um, but it's a bit like being in prison, you know, you, you could say, oh, well, it must be nice being in prison. You don't have to do anything all day. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but one can, one can also become a, a flaneur in one own mind and memories. One of the things I notice when I talk to people in my philosophical practice is that they lack memory of periods in their lives where they worked too hard because they, they work and work and work and make no, take no time to remember anything. And so, or to reflect, that kills your memory, and it, that basically is a part of yourself gone. And I've taken the time now to, well, to dive through my hard disks of 18 years of recording music, and found actually good demos, and I'm going to publish those now on Spotify. <laughs> I make music yeah, yeah. at John Wilwar, and I've only published yeah, yeah. published records, but now I'm just going to publish all my old demos, and I was like 17, 18. Oh dear, this coronavirus really was a bad thing, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was that joke on Twitter, like, um, you know, whatever you do, however depressed you're feeling, please, please don't start a podcast. Well, I've started that way before. 
So that's yeah, yeah, we 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 did as well. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's that's those those things are really true. Um, also, I, I was playing my, you know, my old. I mean, it's a typical middle-aged dad thing to do, but I was playing my old vinyl records. Yeah. Um, and it's it, it, the way it could be quite an intense way of living um, for a while. Uh, but you know, uh, it's also very difficult financially. Um, yeah. And w- what's really tragic is, you know, we're, I'm really about helping small business. You know, the the, the anarchist uh, with, with the small bookshop or the small holding. Um, you know, your own your own living. You're not working for a big corporation, but you you run a small business of some kind. You know, just like one per a family business. You know, yeah. There's some kind of dignity in that. But you know, so to see these businesses which people have been building up their whole lives, um, just destroyed overnight, uh, is very painful. I hope I hope they'll come back. Um, I saw a, a a piece about bookshops. Someone said, "Well, look, you know." Um, when 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 this is over, people are really going to value their bookshops. They're going to be get, you know they're going to be spending all day in bookshop. But oh, thank God I've got a bookshop, you know. Um, so who knows what will happen? They, they could, some good things could come out of it, you know. Um, I think I think for the people in their seventies, it's really bad because they feel completely healthy. They don't want to be stuck at home. Um, they've enjoyed this world. They they're the baby boomers. They benefited from it. They got their flats and houses. Um, and they really don't like it at all. I mean, they think it's silly. People like my mum and my dad. Um, but they, they, you know, my mum's not looking at the bright side. <laughs> uh, but I think they—it's like anything, you know. There yeah. are two sides. I mean, you know. Yes, yeah. as you say, it, it could it could lead to this kind of outpouring of creativity, which I think is a really really good thing. It, um, awesome. yeah. my, my wife Victoria said that too. You know, I'm. My partner Victoria. Well, people are going to have all this time, and so they'll they'll start being creative and doing the things they actually want to do because they have nothing to lose. I mean, it's like you know. Yes, exactly. Because you got nothing else to do, like why not? Just do it. I don't care. I'm not. You know, of, <laughs> and yes, there's lots of energy being redirected away from the economy or the market, etc. And exactly, yeah, projects, etc. And also so, something that people have pointed out is that you know we we might when this is over, hopefully at some point say pre-corona and post-corona it'll be it's it's a global event it's everywhere yeah. and it, it probably it will change how people think of themselves in life i think and, it will you're right i mean i feel like we're on day day 12 day 13 of a new world um you know everything's different and we've got different attitudes nothing's actually changed i mean they're, they're, they're the same number of atoms in the world the same number of people the same amount of food maybe a tiny number of you know slightly more people are getting ill it's not actually like a world war where millions of boys were dying um so it's really weird like a massive uh, global mindset adjustment but yeah. i do agree with you johannes um that um at least we're focusing away from the things that uh i have criticized in my own books and magazines yeah. um you know the, the corporate life but the, the real fear though is that we're going to move into a new system where um you know the conspiracy theorists talk about the world government um this idea that there's you know a kind of there'll be a global state well that's not so far away facebook is like a a, a global organization um, that everyone's part of and so is amazon um well jeff bezos of amazon is so ambitious you know he, he'll never stop growing his company until he's actually king of the entire world um Amazon could do really well out of this and become much, much bigger. And then we all have to work for Amazon instead of running our own pub. So that's my real worry. Um, and, and governments, you know, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. Um, this is how dystopias start, like Nazi Germany. Please, please, uh, you know, please um, uh, control my behavior more. Don't let me go to the park. That's mad, you know. Don't let me go for a walk. I want to see more police on the streets. You know, yeah, that, that's, um, not, that's not a very British attitude, though, I have to say, is it? The people, no, I, the people I talk to say they can bugger off. I'm going <laughs> to the park now. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I know, but there's that's, this kind of like, you know, um, shame, public shaming on Twitter. Oh, have yeah. you seen all these people in Richmond Park going on a bicycle ride? 
<laughs> oh, dare they? Oh, dare they? Like, <laughs> na neighbors are like sleeping on each other. Like, Where are you going in that car? <laughs> oh, just going for a walk. Um, yeah, it's like a, like a kind of communist state, and it's like where you're encouraged to like like in Utopia um, by Thomas More. Everyone's encouraged yeah. to speak on their neighbours. Um, yeah, yeah. And this is how dystopia starts. So, uh, you know, a massive increase of state power is happening. That could, um, that could, that could be. I, I like that, yeah. Well, I, sorry, I was going to say actually, Boris is a is a libertarian. I feel quite lucky that. Yeah, I mean, I'm by nature, either a, a nothing voter or a Labour voter. Yeah. Um, but having said that, you know, um, <laughs> you can sort of imagine Jeremy Corbyn thinking, "This is great." I'm, you know, I'm going to be like a sort of Lenin. Uh, I'm going to expand the power of the state. Everyone will be working for the state. Everything will be nationalised. Everyone will be a state servant, and all literature will be nationalised. And you know, <clears throat> everyone will have to kind of wear a blue cap. And a uniform, and you know, go, go work for the collective in the factory, and there'll be no individuality at all. So yeah. at, at least um, Boris has got a kind of got, got a kind of libertarian attitude. Um, yes, but he, he's, he's being asked by the people to expand the power of the state. He doesn't. He doesn't, it doesn't seem like he wants to. Right? He said several times, "This is something no prime minister wants to do." Yeah, that's right. Up down. I, I, I think that's good. You know, I mean, yeah. you know. Um, I, I, I'm like I said, I'm 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 sort of a Boris hater, really. Uh, but I must say, over the last, I, I, he, I, he's so clever. I think he's just manipulating me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he's just manipulating people like me into liking him. But if, um, so I'm just a victim of his of his kind of superior yeah, yeah. Uh, manipulative skills. Um, <laughs> but that's how I feel at the moment. I, I'll, I'll probably change my yeah. mind. But anyway, and this is when uh, authority, authoritarian systems um you know move in and in the shock doctrine naomi klein you know she, she gives lots of examples of uh where a, a, a state in collusion with the free market will give its system this massive shock um after that it's very easy to for them to do what they want in terms of like opening a new mcdonald's or you know whatever it is i don't know like lending money at ridiculous in rates of interest it's like, please lend me money. Please, please, can I borrow money? I'll give you anything, you know. Uh, okay, but it's going to be 19% interest. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the, the money lenders, um, Amazon governments, maybe they'll, they'll be more powerful. Or maybe, as you say, um, there'll be a kind of new uh, you know, outpouring of creativity. I, Who knows? I see, I see all of these issues. I'm, I, I'm more of them. I mean, you know, in, in Heideggerian terms, one could say it's almost like a titanic battle between what he calls enframing the power of technology and certain cracks in the system too. And of course, yeah, the problem is when the system reinforces itself. But I'd like to envision a very different world where otium cum dignitate, right? Leisure is again the base, as Joseph Peter says, is the basis of civilization and culture. And that's something people like you and I and others should perhaps think towards to speak like that yeah. philosophically. And so if you could perhaps envision the world, what, what it could and should look like after this in, in your wildest dreams. Well, in wildest dreams, I suppose that the dreams I've set out in the books I've already written, um, are something like what I alluded to earlier. I mean, I think some measure of, Actually, I think you can find fr freedom in frugality. Um, so a, a sort of mental attitude, which is a little bit less dependent on money. Um, I'm not saying it's good to be poor. Like, um, I think once you go below a certain income, life is, is very, very miserable uh, because you only think about money. Um, so I'm not saying that everyone should be like St. Francis of Assisi and throw away all their money and, you know, live in rags. Um, but some measure of you know control over one's household, I think, is a good idea. Um, to be sensible about the, the money that's coming in and out, and just to to be in control and to be not in debt um, to the bank, um, to keep your outgoings, to live within your means, and then to find um, a a way of living that you feel is positive. So that could be, you know, I mean, I think it's obvious that um, 
the the delivery drivers, the, the nurses, um, and the social workers, um, the dust the dustmen. Uh, you know, these are the people who are actually. You know, they have they they're useful people, and it's nice to feel useful, like you're doing something useful. Um, but also, you want to be create. I think everybody is a philosopher and an artist as well. So you want to have, as you say, you want to have that time for otium yeah. to develop um, your philosophical nature and your creative nature. And create, you know, you could be creative just in uh, cooking or the garden or decorating the house. Or you know, it doesn't mean that you have to be writing poetry all day long, uh, being creative. Um, a lot of time for fun um, and singing. Uh, I think the main thing that makes people depressed, you know, is to escape from from depression and to escape from this feeling of slavery, uh, is the ultimate goal. Um, yeah. And that could look very different to different people. So, you know, you don't really want to kind of present a list of. No, no, no. Um, I mean, we we could all imagine our own utopia. You yeah. know, I, I, I'm, I don't know. You know, sort of free love. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. I don't know, you know, but that doesn't really get you anywhere, and also it's stable. Um, so, but uh, you know, I think I think you can. It's like William Morris said: you you can imagine people having little gardens, um, having plenty of free time uh, to, to go out into nature. Um, to yes, to worship. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at least religion does bring people otium mm -hmm. or a, di a different yes. view of. Mm -hmm. a, a relaxing of the work ethic you know uh, we've been dominated by the work ethic yes uh since the certainly since the late uh um 18th century yeah with people like adam smith and jeremy bentham and even before that and during the reformation there was a shift you know I, i'm not you know if you look at medieval society people worked yeah you know, people were, were very hard it was incredibly creative i mean it's probably the one of the most creative if you look at um well, just think about, I don't know, Cologne, Venice, you know, um, Florence, Paris, London. I mean, th these are these are medieval cities. They they come from the medieval imagination, um, and the medieval art and the medieval buildings were incredibly beautiful, much more beautiful than much much of modern architecture, much more fun anyway, yes. um, and more varied. And, and lots of people were involved in the creation. So. I, I like medieval values, you know. <laughs> I don't mean uh, like torturing and you know. <laughs> medieval, medieval values were about community. Um, they were quite hostile to the bankers. Um, there were bankers, obviously, Medici's and so on. Um, but there was, you know, um, yes, I know it became corrupt and everything. Um, Calvin and Luther came in, but Calvin and Luther were like quite joyless um, monks. Yeah. Uh, and some of that tough, brutal work ethic um, is there. It's, it's very much there in America. It's, it's in lots of parts of Europe as well, perhaps less in Southern Europe, but it's, it's definitely there. Um, so I'd like to see people changing their mind about that system that we've had in place since the Industrial Revolution, really. You know, go to the factory, work hard for your boss, come home, watch Netflix, as you say, you know, suck up the data stream that uh, is kind of thrown at you and kind of brief attempt to escape from your misery yeah you know <laughs> they go into debt all that sort of thing i mean people have been complaining about this forever you know like the, the romantic poets punk the punk movement was all about about this you know yeah do you, do you do you want to live do you want to have a boring job or a bullshit job or a crap job you know do, do something with your life um so obviously, I would hope that those that that you know the anarchic principle would would come out, um, and the enslaving principle would would die down. But who knows? It might go the other way. Hopefully, hopefully, I mean, hopefully, it will come closer to what you're envisioning. And I'm, I've been speaking about a coming renaissance. Of course, I can't see the future, but I'd like to see it coming. It would be good. Yes, it would be good. So thank you very much, Tom. Your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Hannes. Yeah, thanks for um uh and all your work, which is great as well, and bringing this idea of dignified leisure in front of people. That you know, leisure is not laziness. Leisure is um important to it's important to cultivate, like we said, your own soul and your body and your mind. Yes.
Exacto. Thank you, Tom.